Welcome. Good evening. This is the Board of Education meeting for the Hyde Park Central School District. Today is Thursday, October 14th. Um, can everybody please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'm feeling a little rusty. Um, at this time, we um, we don't have any agenda modifications, I believe. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Um, so I'd like a motion to adopt the agenda, please. So moved, Jeff. Second, Margaret. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Okay, um, let's see, we have some upcoming events. Um, we have the Harvest Pops concert at FDR, which is Wednesday, October 27th at 6.30 at the high school. Um, our next Board of Education meeting is Thursday, October 28th here at district office at 7 p.m. Um, and then we have the FDR fall drama in the auditorium at the high school on Friday, October 29th and on Saturday, October 30th. Um, and that's what I have for upcoming events. Does anybody have any other events that I should mention? Okay. Ooh. Okay, so let's move on to Pride. Um, 6.1. So you, would you like to start? Okay, so at FDR, um, they hosted a successful virtual Meet the Staff Night and received a ton of positive feedback. Mm -hmm. And yesterday, the senior class gathered to take their senior class photo in front of the bleachers. Mm -hmm. um, we had about 120 uh, FDR seniors. Um, there will be a financial aid night for parents of seniors that is being hosted by our FDR guidance department, and any additional information on that can be found on the website. The FDR soccer team showed support by wearing pink at their soccer games and during the day for the Miles of Hope Breast Cancer Foundation. They would like to thank everyone who supported in the Pink Out campaign, and with all the support, they were able to raise $1,200. Also, tickets for the fall drama Almost Maine are now available, and the dates are October 29th and the 30th. At HMS, on October 22nd, they will be hosting a family outdoor movie with concessions for sale. The movie is PBS sponsor, PBIS sponsored, and they will be showing Hocus Pocus. Um, bring a chair around 5.30 to settle in before the movie at 6. At North Park Elementary, on the 15th, they will be having a spirit day, and on the 22nd, they will be hosting a trunk or treat, and flyers for that will be going home. Feel free to be, bring families and decorate your trunk. November 11th through the 19th, there will be an in-house book fair discount card sale. At Netherwood, they will be having a fall harvest parade at the end of the month, and they invite students and staff to dress up as their favorite character. They were also started a garden club this week, um, which takes place before school. Students help tidy up the garden until it's time for breakfast, and then they start their day. During the early stages, students will tame the weeds and also plant new bulbs that will sprout in the spring. The Fairview Fire District will be having a community day this Sunday, October 17th, 1 to 5 p.m. as well. And that is all that I have. I have one that you can see, but I wanted to read it out loud. Um, and our own Caitlin Wagner, teacher at FDR, um, was recognized by the Dutchess County Regional Chamber of Commerce as one of the top 40 under 40. She was nominated by one of her seniors. And there is a link to the article, and I just want to give my congratulations to Caitlin. She teaches AVID and reading up at the high school and used to actually work at the middle school, and she's just a very special teacher, and we're very proud to have her. Okay, thank you. Um, at this time, we'll go on to your, the superintendent's report. So I have two follow-up pieces from last time um, for people paying, for people, um, paying attention. I have some follow-up from our last meeting. 
Um, there was a question about a budget transfer um, last time, and the original transfer um, was from the budget code for athletic contractual um, to athletic supplies. So um, the paperwork completed on the original transfer just had the wrong budget code and was transferred um, to the code for concessions. So the district treasurer um, was contacted to re help rectify the situation and suggested that another budget transfer be made. The original reason for the transfer is there was an increase in participation of athletic programs and we wanted to order more supplies for the remainder of the school year. So the basic reason was more students participating, which is great, and that's really the backstory why it was happening at this point in the year. And <laughs> that's funny. Um, so people know what's happening with the funds and people are paying attention. Um, the next one is a follow-up on this, the question of substitute teachers because you know people keep hearing about shortages, not just in our district, um, but shortages of subs across the state. Um, so I got some good information from Shelby Outwater and Human Resources. They have been scheduling at least one orientation per week, adding subs regularly. Um, there's a continued need in all the buildings and departments. So there are 12 tonight on tonight's agenda, 12 new um, substitutes. And, you know, it's, um, it can be misleading because we have 135 active substitutes on the list, and yet we're short, you know, every day. So some work every day, some work a few days a month, others more sporadically. Um, we do have active recruitments on OLAS and Indeed.com, which are, the, you know, the, the most used. Um, and the department follows up with every applicant within 48 hours of receiving their resume. 35 to 45% of the candidates actually follow through with the application and fingerprint process. Um, and there are an additional 12 substitute candidates currently going through the orientation fingerprinting process. So we've not stopped, um, but as you can imagine with substitute shortages across the region, people are fighting for subs. So by the time we call in for one, they, they may already be called for another district. But I wanted to give you that update on the work we're doing to increase our sub list. So thank you, Shelby and Cheryl, who are here, and Estelle as well. OK, thank you. Um, and now we have our external auditor's report. Um, I'd like to uh, introduce Kyleen. Oh, you Thank you. The, go to the podium, please. Sorry. So Kyleen Fitzik is our uh, audit manager. I hope I got the title right. She's really the uh, lead auditor when uh, the external auditors are here in the summer. So she comes with her team, and uh, they uh, look at our financials because the uh, goal is to provide an opinion on our financial statements. Thank you, Linda. My name is Kyleen Fitzik, and I'm an external auditor with the Bonadeo Group and was the manager on your school district's audit engagement. We recently completed the audit and went over all the reports in detail with your audit committee. I'm here tonight just to go over in a summarized version at a very high level um, the audit questions or the audit reports and the results and any question and answer any questions that, that you may have. First, I would like to thank Linda and, and the business office um, for, for all of their assistance during the audit. They were very responsive to our requests and uh, being the, the first auditors for you know, the kickoff year with them, it was a wonderful experience and we can't, can't thank them enough for all, all, of their, all of their help. So there are four deliverables that we provided to the board. Um, the first is your financial statements. The second is your audit of the extra classroom financial statements. The third is the required communications letter. And then the fourth is the management letter. So at a high level, um, the school district's annual audit of the financial statements includes the independent auditor's opinion on the financial statements. And we are issuing an unmodified opinion on your financial statements. An unmodified opinion is the highest level of assurance that we as auditors can give you. The other report that is included in your basic financial statements is the government auditing standards report. This report requires to gain an understanding and report on your internal controls over financial reporting. And we're pleased to say that we noted no material weaknesses, no significant deficiencies in the financial reporting over the internal controls. The second part of the report is your compliance with laws, regulations, and grant contracts, that non-compliance 
could lead to a material financial statement impact. There is one compliance finding to report. The district is limited to retaining 4% of the school budget and the unreserved unappropriated fund balance. You are over that limit as of June 30, 30th, 2021 and was at 4.67%. Then there is the independent auditor's report on compliance with requirements to each major program and on the internal control over compliance in accordance with uniform guidance. And in basic terms, that's the audit on your federal awards. We are issuing an unmodified opinion, again, the highest level of assurance that we as auditors can give you. We did not identify any material weaknesses and did not identify any significant deficiencies on any internal controls over the major programs for federal awards. We are also issuing the school district's annual audit of the extra classroom financial statements. We are issuing an unmodified opinion on that financial statement. Then lastly, the management letter was provided to all of you and that just provides some recommendations in terms um, for the extracurricular clubs and the club advisors. So that's a very high level review of your, of your audit results. I'm open to any questions that, that any of you may have. Does anybody have any questions? I just wanna thank you for all the work that you did and really appreciate it and appreciate the feedback that you gave us. Thank of you. Course. Thank, you for, thank you for having us, it was a great year. Thank you. When do we talk about the uh, recommendation about the clubs that they have in their role? We can talk about it. We can talk about it anytime you want. Well, right. I, mean, I think year after year. Well, sorry. <laughs> year after year, we, we do not do well on that area. So mm -hmm. I think we need to figure out something so that during these external audits, we don't uh, get written up. And it, I think um, it's happened every year since I've been on the board. So. I agree, and you, you know I agree. <laughs> um, we did take steps a couple of years ago. Well, Linda, you can help me with that a little bit, where we, we developed um, specific processes in place, and we're following up on those with the advisors and um, who's, who's the, the, uh, the central treasurer? The central treasurer, yes. Mm -hmm. um, so we are doing that. We are going to look at our policies. I'd already spoke to Jay about reviewing our policies so that we can better define the responsibilities of um, the, extra the extra classroom funds and what the responsibilities are and what we can, re you know, we can do there. And we're going to have another meeting. We're gonna to talk to them. I know that we've had some new advisors come on and about onboarding them better. Um, and I think we're, we're working on this. We have to, you're right. We've got to come up with some processes and that's what we're going to do. We started a few years ago and we're going to continue to do that. Um, do you have anything to add? Oh, I'll, I'll just say that uh, we will have to have a corrective action plan for the items that are listed in the, mm -hmm. for the findings for extra classroom. Right. So that's something that will be, uh, that the board will have to approve um, and will be ready soon. And at that time of, uh, you know, we'll actually review that with the audit committee before we bring it here to the board. Do you have any recommendations? No, so thoughts? good. So we're going to do it at the audit committee yeah. level mm -hmm. to come up with ideas and then bring it forward. Okay. Yeah, like normally, normally the way that process works is I'll meet with the principals and uh, the central treasurers. Uh, we'll come up with a, a plan and then review that with the audit committee before it comes to the board for approval. Okay, and, and I didn't, in the full report, does it spell out specifically what the misses were? And it, 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 it describes exactly what happened, I would imagine? Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't detail the, the but like which school or which club it occurred, but the issues are listed okay, there. Okay, good, yes. all right, so we have some, okay, good. Yeah. Yep, that's all I had. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank Anybody you. else? Okay. Um, um, we're also, we're, our next presentation is for the new capital project um, with Elliot Sheldon and CSR and the Palumbo Group.
So tonight with us we have uh, Tom Ritzenthar of CS Arch, Dan Woodside, and uh, Matt Zerkowski. So tonight we're going to talk about our uh, capital project planning. So this is the next capital project. Um, at this point we'll turn it over to Tom. If there's any questions, please don't, don't hesitate. Stop us. Let's talk about it. Mm -hmm. And we'll reconvene in a little bit. Good evening. So this is, uh, it's nice to see everybody again. It's been a few weeks since we last presented uh, at the elementary. So again, an update on the progress that we're making with respect to the next capital proje uh, project. Uh, so as we reported out uh, in previous presentations, we've done a lot of existing condition documentation and we continue to do that as we develop uh, the designs for the specific scope of work. Um, as you know, we, we completed tours of various uh, auditoriums around the area. So that gave us a good uh, baseline of information about what might be potentially possible and considered for uh, both the FDR and the Haviland Auditorium renovations. Uh, geotechnical and land survey services are underway at multiple locations and some are actually complete and some are nearing complete. Um, we made recommendations to the district and move forward with those uh, individual firms to complete that work. And again, that's very important information that informs our budgeting process with the various items of scope that we're considering. Uh, of course, we've got HVAC upgrades uh, and, and Matt will talk about that in a little bit as we go through the various scopes, the concepts of the security vestibules and we've advanced that as well, as well as the developing options for Ralph R. Smith. Uh, and then a lot of other refinements of those scope. We'll, we'll be presenting uh, some scope identification and clarity so that the Plumo Group can um, work with us to develop cost estimates uh, so that we can present that uh, eventually to the DLT and then ultimately to the Board of Education. So that's a quick overview. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the progress of the auditorium. So we did visit uh, several auditoriums, uh, Newburg, Red Hook, and uh, uh, and Pine Plains. Uh, Pine Plains was just done uh, about a year and a half ago. Uh, so it gave us a really a, a very, uh, each one is done very differently <laughs> and emphasizes very different things. So it was good for all of those who came to participate and view those, uh, gave a good baseline of information on different approaches to uh, the respective auditoriums. And we may take different approaches for Avalon and FDR. They're very different types of space. And of course, uh, hopefully um, a lot of folks will be sitting on these chairs. We've had some samples delivered as we talk about replacement seating. Uh, we wanna make sure that uh, everyone can touch and feel and see the various levels of quality and look at the, uh, how the seats look. We have different end panel discussions uh, and all those will be options that we have as we start to begin to put budgets together uh, to support uh, those renovations. I think from here, I'm going to let Matt come up and talk about uh, site work and geotechnical. Good evening, everyone. Um, so yes, as, as Tom alluded to, um, we have um, uh, started our uh, fieldwork efforts for uh, geotechnical and land surveying. Um, so the drilling uh, that was required uh, for our borings uh, were completed uh, at Ralph R. Smith about a week and a half or so ago. Um, we are anticipating our uh, geotechnical report um, from Tectonic uh, no later than this week. Um, that information is going to be fed to our civil engineer um, as well as all of the land surveying efforts. Um, we have uh, currently wrapped up the surveying here for Central Admin. Um, they are moving over to uh, Ralph R. Smith uh, starting uh, early next week and then immediately after that is FDR. Um, and uh, in the meantime, our uh, landscape architect is uh, going to be starting their field work at FDR for um, the uh, track uh, resurfacing. Um, so they'll be, they'll be out uh, at the high school um, within a week or so. Um, and just as a recap, uh, the geotechnical um, uh, consultant uh, conducted 10 borings um, throughout the site over at Ralph R. Smith. And uh, in one of the upcoming slides, 
um, you'll see the sort of impact that the locations of the borings have on our um, uh, proposed layouts. So in these two instances, and this has been um, shared with uh, the um, district's uh, SAVE committee, um, we're going to be reconvening again a week from yesterday, I think it'll be the 20th, um, to go through these two schemes. We originally started with five schemes. Um, there's been a great uh, collaboration between the district and our engineer of record. Um, so we have these, these two schemes that uh, both uh, address the same concern. Um, we're trying to separate bus and vehicular traffic um, from pedestrian traffic, mainly having parent drop-off of students separate from the buses. So in both of these schemes here, and I, and I understand it's a little difficult to see at this scale, um, having buses come in and queued up on an angle and simply peeling away, um, it's the best, sort of the most efficient use of space. Um, in both of these instances, on the left-hand uh, option one, the, the parent uh, drop-off area is planned north. It's between the building and the bus, um, the transportation uh, building. And on option two, which is on the right-hand side, that same sort of uh, uh, concept is laid out planned south um, of, the, of the main dri drive aisle. Again, we are refining these, these uh, options through further development with the SAVE committee. Um, we're hoping to refine or, or possibly combine these two uh, for presentation um, to the district. It's a work in progress, but we have uh, subsurface uh, findings. You know, the borings go through, they let us know what's, what sort of soils we're dealing with. That has an impact on drainage, uh, drive lane, impervious surfaces, asphalt of the like. So we want to make sure that what we're proposing is, is suitable for uh, the strata that we find below grade. So you won't know that, and as Tom mentioned, this, this feeds into budgeting, because you don't, you don't want to start uh, finding all these surprises after you've got excavators out there doing their thing. Um, as Tom mentioned, uh, one of the other uh, capital project uh, bullet items is um, HVAC upgrades, uh, mainly at Violet Ave and at FDR. So Violet Ave is a little bit uh, more intensive in that uh, we're looking at a full boiler conversion, um, central chiller, and replacement of unit ventilators. So as we're all aware at Violet Ave, we have historical uh, impact sight lines, and, and overall aesthetics on the outside of the building is a big concern. Um, when we're doing full boiler conversion, it's going to affect pretty much every piece of equipment in the building to some level. Um, this is something that our engineers uh, in uh, consult with existing condition drawings are out in the field verifying, and we're working through uh, different schemes uh, to present to the district. So it's a, it's a pretty big undertaking. Similarly, over at FDR, uh, we're looking at the addition of air conditioning for cooling in the auditorium, the gymnasium, and some of the summer school um, spaces. I think it's zones five and six. So this is a piggyback uh, 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 concept off of what we've already done. Um, I know FDRs, uh, we're going through extensive uh, HVAC upgrades there now. Um, we're, we're continuing that effort. Um, in zones five and six. Another very critical item here is uh, security vestibules, secured vestibules. Um, so in past uh, SAVE committee uh, meetings uh, with the district over the last uh, couple of weeks or so, conceptual plans were shared. Um, we know that currently at FDR and at Haviland, you have a uh, vestibule or a lobby guard. It's manned at a kiosk. Um, whereas all your other schools um, currently don't have that or the layout of the school might be a little um, cumbersome to add one. I know we don't want to add additional uh, administrative uh, staff to basically man the front door. So we've looked at a series of concepts where we have um, uh, secured vestibule kiosks. So this would be all um, 
addressed from a technology point of view from the main office. So you would have someone dedicated in the main office um, at their desk uh, being able to interact with any visitor, buzz and allow them in. There would be a sort of a lobby guard system within the vestibule to scan credentials. The main office would then allow them into the second door. Um, if you can picture, say, Violet Ave, uh, say on the outside of the building, having an intercom or a card reader allowing someone into the building. You're in that very um, intimate uh, entry vestibule. Um, and, and from the main office, which won't have direct eyesight to that vestibule, because it's several feet uh, lower in elevation, you'd be able to communicate via video screen, scan the credentials, buzz them in through the second set of doors. Um, Violet Ave's a little unique in that funneling people from the main door into the main office is a little, yeah, we're gonna have to look at that a little bit more. Um, but, but instances like um, uh, North Park um, or Netherwood, having, having eyes from the main office will, will help. Uh, we don't wanna add additional uh, admin um, to these spaces. Uh, so um, we, uh, CS Arch is um, putting together some photos of some recent uh, installations to share with the district so you can get an idea of what sort of an unmanned kiosk might look like. Um, and I think that there's been discussions in the recent save committee to provide a little mock-up so people can get an idea of um, what sort of space are we looking at for say, um, you know, North Park or Netherwood. And again, these, between the technology and the um, uh, security glazing, um, it, would, it would create sort of this, this dedicated space to vet and permit visitors in. Um, so uh, lockdown and uh, building security is taking into consideration on all of these layouts as well too. And these, these were provided as um, conceptual sketches. We, we, we received feedback and we will, um, uh, continue our um, uh, design for all these spaces for future um, committee review. I'll turn this back over to Tom for overall schedule. So looking at our, did that turn on? No. So looking at our overall schedule, a um, couple things you're, you'll notice we're, we're in that development, that first uh, that first red line with arrows on either side developing the scope and the budgets you'll see that we've got a dlt workshop scheduled for november 4th and uh, so there they're going to see a lot more uh, detailed information along with the budgeting uh, for each of these uh, in total for the whole program uh, which will be nice uh, to to see all together uh, we're targeting november 18th for a recommendation from the dlt to the board of education and then we're going to have a little bit of time, November, December, uh, for the Board of Education to really have their review and offer comment and allow us to do another set of revisions on both the project details, scope, and budget. Um, we do have the State Environmental Quality Review to go through. Uh, we're targeting November, December for that review. Uh, we can really begin that process as soon as we have an outline of all the scope that's involved. So we'll know kind of what the worst case scenario is and we'll base the seeker upon that uh, so we can get that process moving forward. And then uh, looking at uh, February 22nd referendum vote date, the board would have to pass resolution to hold a referendum vote uh, and they, they would have to do that at the December 16th uh, Board of Education meeting. So that's right now where our current uh, schedule and thinking is. Uh, I think we're in, in a good zone right now um, and it really gives us that time to have the development of each of the concepts uh, with a lot of confidence, hopefully both in, in the presentation of the materials and, and uh, in, the, in the investigation uh, of all of, the, uh, all of the items. So thinking about next steps, uh, again, we're completing survey and geotechnical. Geotechnical is actually complete. We're just waiting for the reports. Um, you know, we've reviewed the milestone schedule. That DLT meeting is gonna be really important uh, to look at all the detail uh, and, and get that uh, amount of feedback from the committee, uh, uh, from the team. Uh, again, the, the adopt the recommendation for final capital scope and budget, and then we'll, we'll have completed the seeker at that point. 
uh, with the board resolution targeted for the December meeting and the bond referendum for February of, uh, of next year. Is there any questions? I know that's a lot of information in a pretty condensed amount of time. I have a question for Linda. Are, prior to that, um, coming up with the, the scope and the budget, are we going to, you know, I, we normally get that debt service overview look from our financial analyst. Is that going to happen prior to us looking at the budget for this? So uh, Jason already provided the, the budget that he says would fit into our debt service plan so that we're not adding um, any uh, t oh, any amount okay. to the tax I, I levy. I must have missed that, sorry. And um, <laughs> he did that uh, before we uh, decided to move forward with, the, with okay. the, this capital project. And then I believe usually after we know where we are with the budget, then he will put together something and come back and talk to the board about, um, you know, where our debt service is at that time. Okay. Yeah. Okay, good. Because yeah. we'll reconfirm project aid ability, you know, it, it, it'll go through that with, with all of the, uh, with all yeah. the information that we have at that yeah, point. Because the, yeah, like Tom just said, there'll be more information that Jason doesn't have right now because some of the, uh, you know, there might be some things in the project that aren't aidable or um, we're not sure exactly how many building aid units we have for each building at this time. Mm -hmm. Right, okay. we'll have to request yeah. the, uh, the MCAs for each of the buildings. Um, you know, uh, Ralph R. Smith is a little tricky. We have to have a building project in order to affect. So we're going to do the vestibule there, so that'll qualify the incidentals, uh, which is all of the site work component. But we need to make sure, based on that budget, we have enough of the maximum cost allowance to support it, or some of that will, uh, you know, we'll know at that point that some of it may or may not be supported uh, with, with building. So last time when we did this, made sure so like that december meeting mm -hmm. you look to adopt your resolution if not prior to that certainly that night he will do an entire review for you of exactly where the what the local impact will be if there's any at all if there's not at all mm -hmm. but you'll definitely get that layout that okay yeah. okay good thank you and then jay i just said he mentioned there was a 1013 say is that a different save committee than i'm on that's the, no, uh, that's Ralph R. Smith's save committee oh, for, okay. for the bus loop. We've been working specifically with Ralph R. Smith on their bus loop. Yeah, okay. We did meet on the vestibules with the district save committee. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I was there, but then I saw a ten thirteen save. I'm like, oh, I, I think I missed something. That was. Um, <laughs> we're actually going to meet again next week on okay. the twentieth to, to review these two concepts. We've. Okay. We keep. We're narrowing it down. So okay. that's okay. All right. Good. Thanks. Um, also, while you're here, I believe the November 4th evening DLT date has changed. There was a conflict with the FDR PTSA meeting. Okay. And so I just made a note to make sure that's communicated to all of you. And also the calendar still has that on it for people looking at the electronic calendar. So I'm going to confirm. I think I know when it is, but I don't want to say another wrong date. <laughs> so for anyone out there listening who might, might be on DLT and confused, I'll, I'll get that information out tomorrow. Sorry. Yep, no problem. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I just want to ask one more question. So are we working on incorporating the Haviland seats into this capital project? <laughs> yeah. You, you knew I was going to ask yeah. about that. <laughs> or at the very yeah. least, or at the very least a plan on so, when that can happen. So the goal is by November 4th, we at least have a uh, defined scope for each, each part of the project. Mm -hmm. And then what Palumbo Group's going to help us with, along with CSR, is put a detailed estimate together for each part of the project. Okay. And then as we move through this process, we may or may not be able to do everything based on where, where that referendum money is going to come from. But they're going to be on the list. But we will have a line item for you. Yeah, we'll have a line item. That's, it, thank it, you. So, <laughs> that's yeah, right. We'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll, uh, we'll paint them whatever color you want. No. Um, the idea is that we want to have a line item for everything. Thank you. And then we'll look at the debt service and you know mm -hmm. decide whether everything fits in hopefully it will but we all know that it's not always the case so we're being open that it may not all fit into this that we talked mm -hmm. about at dlt and then we'll, we'll make those decisions as a group as to what is the most important or look at the other options as to how it does affect the debt service right perfect so thank you i, I would like just i'll add that uh our financial advisor um, will look at the numbers again we do have money in capital reserve 
So when he gave us the budget for this, he did say, you know, if something comes, if there's something else that the district wants to add or if it's a little bit over, he's like, please don't like just say now that we can't do it because he'd like to rerun the numbers that he gave us is we may be able to use capital reserve and not have any additional borrowing. Mm -hmm. Does capital reserve contribute to that overage of the four percent that we're over? No. no. We need no. that extra over four percent to the capital reserve. <laughs> so, the vote, right? Yeah, so mm -hmm. th that would have to be approved by the voters um, in May. We could have a, a capital reserve um, on the budget vote then to add more money to it. Okay. So um, I think it was a great presentation. It's great to see the DLT and the safe committees are involved, of course. One question some people might have is in the proposed vestibules, will there be an ability to do some of the COVID screenings or temperature checks, or would that be done once the person is allowed into the school? So right now, we haven't looked at that, but that's certainly something we can look further into. Um, I know this year we're, we have uh, a screening that's online that you fill out prior to going to school and we're not doing temperature checks at the moment doesn't mm -hmm. mean things won't change um, but it's all you know with technology I think anything's possible it's just a matter of budgeting for it thank you okay no other questions all right thank you so much <laughs> okay, next we um, have the Haviland Middle School Continuous Improvement Process with Eric Shaw. Good evening. First, I want to start by thanking, thanking the board for this opportunity to um, share the work that the Continuous Improvement Team has been doing at Haviland Middle School. And we're, before I dive in, I just, I feel like really compelled to recognize and appreciate our Haviland Middle School teachers and staff. Uh, their dedication and support of the students and of each other is amazing to witness and is very much appreciated. They are a special group of dedicated professionals who despite the pressures that have come with this global pandemic, work every day to demonstrate to our students what it means to rise above. And for this, I'm grateful to them. I also am grateful to both our, our building leadership team and our continuous improvement team, many who, who serve on both groups. <coughs> I want to thank them for their time, commitment, and effort in planning for meaningful improvement here at HMS. And to our Board of Ed, and I don't say this lightly, uh, following the New York State Ed process is challenging enough in a typical year. But to have created two plans in less than 10 months during a global pandemic is, I got to imagine, unheard of and an incredible achievement and must be recognized and appreciated. And just a giant thank you to our whole team for that work. So just, uh, just a reminder for uh, the board and for those listening in the community that Havel Middle School is identified as a targeted support and improvement school under the ESSA regulations as the Every Student Succeeds Act. And we've been identified for areas of students not meeting proficiency in ELA and math for three subgroups. That's our black students, our Hispanic and Latino students, and our economically disadvantaged students. In addition, we are also uh, part of that status because our economically disadvantaged students have been identified as a subgroup not meeting the markers for chronic absenteeism. Here is a snapshot for those who might remember, uh, I presented um, last January for our modified improvement plan that was for essentially January to June of 2021 school year. We worked on that for seven weeks straight, three hour meetings a night, um, one night a week with our, our BLT. And that plan charged us with coming up with five goals. The five goals uh, had to be in the areas of deficit. So we had a goal in ELA, a goal in math, a goal around chronic absenteeism. And we also had to provide a, a, a goal around perceptual data in our survey work. And then we also had to build in a building-wide strategy from a, a state-approved list. And we chose to work on the concept of pro professional learning communities. That's a lot of information there. And just to give you a recap, on our work, uh, we aligned our ELA and math targets to the district's DCEP around RIT, student RIT growth scores. 
for both ELA and math in the bands for grades six, seven, and eight. Um, we did hit those targets, but I also want to caution you that the data still needs to go, be gone through in terms of last year's instructional program, last year's student experience, and to really work to quantify the learning. And that would be tied to our MAPS assessment. And then there's a whole other task of then looking and saying, well, how, how might that actually be extrapolated to what it might look like on a New York State assessment? Because the reality is we have the plan. We had to tie it to MAPS because we didn't have an alternate measurement. But we are ultimately measured, and no matter last year's plan or this, this current year's plan, by the outcomes on student performance on the ELA and math assessments. Um, I will also share that I can go deeper into data at my December um, board presentation for Havel Middle School as we go take a deep dive and look at our, our growth and our achievement in, in maps in both ELA and math in all subgroups. Uh, I also want to share that in the chronic absenteeism goal, it was a challenge. Data collection was a challenge last year. We had multiple models of hybrid and in-person and full remote and quarantines and physically in class or physically at home trying to learn the same material. Uh, however, you know, our, our state reporting data at 17-18 had us at 28.3% uh, of economically disadvantaged students as chronically absent. In 1819, which was the year uh, that finally left us onto the list, we had 30.2% um, of our students who were economically disadvantaged, chronically absent. This past year, that number uh, was brought down to 23.4. So it's the best number we've had in the last three school years. And I attribute a lot of work to that goal. And you guys might remember some of it. We created a chronic absentee team, a CAT team, if you will, that really zeroed in on the students who are missing school, who were absent in a global pandemic, students who were just disappeared. And we ultimately translated to almost 100 home visits. Uh, it translated into uh, offering food supplies physical school supplies, and also, you guys might remember, laundry services for some families, which we hope to uh, partner with the High Park Laundromat. And we've begun our initial work in that again as part of our work this year is still supporting our economically disadvantaged students around chronic absenteeism. So with that mindset of uh, five goals in very prescribed areas, this year in over the course of the school year, and wasn't delivered, us till, delivered to us as a school building till May, the state changed the criteria for how we're to create planning for the current year, 21-22. So we were um, tasked with the creation of the continuous improvement team, uh, which included building staff, teachers, parents, and administrators. Um, and then we also were created or, a task with the uh, the job of starting with this, this research review on how learning happens from the New York State, we were asked to do an equity self-review of practices, experiences, and beliefs inside our building. We did that with our entire staff, just not the um, improvement team. We did a student interview process we, where we interviewed 25 students across grade levels, across subgroups that represented the, the students that are at risk in our building. We did uh, perceptual data surveys for our parents, our students, and our faculty and staff. We did one in the, the fall of last year, and then we did another one in June of this past year. And then we looked at our chronic absenteeism data once it was all in at the end of the year. And overall, the state has asked us to move away from five goals to creating the concept of two to four commitments. And the commitments are based in really looking at the experience of this past school year and the trauma that the pandemic has caused and listening to our students about that experience and trying to improve on success of, and for outcomes for next year. Although it's not directly tied to a MAP assessment or a New York State assessment, it is definitely ultimately measured by the New York State assessment, which I firmly believe will be occurring this school year. Uh, and so what you're going to see here are two commitments that we came up with. The first commitment is in, I'm already on two. First commitment is sort of, you think about it as instructional equity, ensuring instructional equity, including having all students receiving high level instruction in all classrooms with meaningful engagement through teacher collaboration, student voice, opportunity, and agency. And under that commitment, we have four strategies where we're going to be working on. And those strategies include increasing extended day opportunities, 
a reduction in chronic absenteeism, a structured use, of, or I could say a restructured use of department time, and uh, ac academic progress monitoring. And all of those strategies are also tied into the DCEP, are also tied into the, the, um, the district strategic plan as sort of a cohesive unit. There are flavors that are HMS specific, but certainly have strong ties to what's happening in the district overall. Our second commitment has to do where I couch that in, in relational capacity. And that was a really big thing that we learned from our survey data. We spent a year telling certain groups they could come in and certain groups they couldn't and this day and that day and parents have to wait outside and the, all the work that we did on building um, community at Haviland from six years straight of Haviland Middle School community nights to a community room to all the things we learned when we were a focus school back in 2013 and we were able to shed that status to a school in good standing, we kept that work. But one pandemic made that all crash again. So we learned a lot from our survey data, hearing from our students, hearing from our teachers, hearing from our parents, that our relational capacity is, we, our strategies, well, first is building connections with Havel stakeholders, including students, staff, families, and community by partnering for success to strengthen and cultivate relationships and sense of belonging. We uh, began that work with the first strategy was uh, actually building in individual grade level orientation nights. We had spent a year not having one. We did a virtual one for sixth grade. This year, we invited them all in. And because of physical distancing, we actually did multiple for each grade for seventh and eighth so that we could have as many people come in as possible. Uh, we are working towards uh, student voice at the building leadership level. We learned a lot from the work that Lynette Williams was doing at North Park Elementary and having that student voice there. And that presentation that she did for the board and the students did for the board was really eye-opening for our committee and really tying in that voice there. And we appreciate that sort of groundbreaking work for at the uh, K-8 level. Uh, Reimagining communication and how we reach out. We spent a year with lots of school messengers and emails and really like one-way broadcasts. And we're really working on how we might reimagine how we communicate. And then finally, um, looking for uh, community involvement opportunities. So with that being said, our BLT has already rolled up its sleeves. We already have started a lot of work in this areas. And we're also getting a lot of support from the district and moving forward with actualizing our plan to a point that I really feel heartened by the progress as we're only five weeks into school and really imagine where this will end us up as we move into the spring. Again, tied towards the state assessment time because instructional equity and a sense of belonging, a relational capacity to go far away to our, our students realizing success. And I will, at this point, turn it over if there's any questions from the committee, or the board, sorry. So Eric, I know it's kind of early, but how would you say now that we have all students back into the schools is chronic absenteeism? I mean, I know you only have one month of data. Well, that's a great that question. Working? So. I tracked it the first uh, 15 days of school, and our absenteeism, our, our attendance rate, uh, may frame it in a positive, was the highest I've seen in a very long time from all subgroups. I didn't break it from all, from like the all students group. I didn't break it down to subgroups yet, uh, but our, to part of our actualizing that strategy is our guidance counselors are going in and meeting monthly with the teams of teachers to really boots on the ground, like what's happening day to day in your classroom. We can look at reports, but we want to know that sort of what's the story behind the absenteeism. And one of the challenges that we have is not that we have a lots of students being quarantined as a result of an exposure, but there have been exposures, there have been some quarantines, and that does create a little bit of skewed data because that isn't always tied to a daily present. That sometimes is an absence unless we're able to find the home tutoring services to support them while they're out. And we've had a, a, some success with that, but not complete success. But we'll be looking at those numbers. It is probably a little bit too early to tell, but uh, overall, I think the first day of school, I had asked for like how many are here and how many should be here. And we had uh, 757 out of the 769 students that were marked daily present that day. And there was excitement was palpable. Like kids were happy to back, happy to be back, feeling, getting comfortable. Um, one of the realities, and it was shared by uh, Dr. Brown uh, the other day in a meeting, and something where it really actually put a lot of um, context to what we were feeling, 
in relation to where our students are in the sort of socialization aspect of being part of middle school. And really the thought that our, our eighth graders, the last time they were in a full year of school, was in fifth grade. So there's a lot of lost opportunity in, in not just learning in classroom time, but the socialization that happens in these really, as it could be tumultuous middle school years, uh, that we're, we're really seeing some of those things pop up. And really, it was actually put a lot of context in some of the, the uh, experiences we're seeing. So we're hoping to uh, learn from that and maybe actually sort of redesign again and Aside from the orientations, and one way to offset that second week of school, I did do grade level assemblies. We hadn't done those in two years. Just a really level set about like, what does it mean to be a Havel Middle School student? How do you rise above? Where's your go-to network? You know, all the things that should be common sense over the years, but um, because we haven't had over those years with this group of students, we're sort of resetting that as a little bit. Thank you. No problem. Anybody else? All right, no, thanks. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks for everything. Okay, okay next is public participation. Um, I'd like to say that as a general rule, public participation will be limited to three minutes total per speaker, with the first public participation segment limited to 21 minutes. The segment of time may be modified by the board as deemed appropriate. The board requests that remarks be courteous and respectful of all. Um, the process is that the board will listen to your comments and at the end they will respond after public participation has been closed. So that being said, may I have a motion to enter public participation? So moved by. Second, Jeff. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, we're in public participation. Is there anybody who'd like to address the board? Mm -hmm. step. Okay. Okay. Can I take this down or? Please take, um. So, um, I'm here to speak about the urgent need for the COVID tests to be at school level. The most mild symptoms a child may experience around this list. It's literally everything. Um, a child then has to get a negative COVID test to return to school. This becomes not only overwhelming for a family to have to get this done ASAP so a child can return to school the next day, but also it is overwhelming for the doctor's office. I experienced this firsthand this week when my child was sent, to the, sent home for a headache. Um, I worked all day to get an appointment, then had to wait two hours. I was even on a cancellation list. Um, if, if the school is going to have such a strict requirement for a runny nose or a headache, then they need to start offering this at school level. Um, I, I feel like this is, has to require serious attention like immediately because I don't know how many kids are going home sick every day. And if I didn't get my daughter to get a test, she's missing a day of school. So I really think that you guys really need to address this matter. That's all I have to say. Okay, thank you. And I'm sorry, did, did you state your name? My name is Casey O'Hearn. Thank you. Oh. Is there anybody, thank you, I'm sorry. I. I was trying to get that down. Is there anybody else who would like to address the board? Okay, um, at this point we'll close public participation. Um, can, can you address the, the policies? That yeah, I can start and I think my eye contact with Eric Shaw was that he can add to that as the COVID coordinator, which, so it is something we're working on actually. So um, as most people are aware, um, there's a requirement to offer weekly testing um, for staff. Um, for all faculty and staff, and, and that's something that we've been providing and working on providing more of. Um, and in addition to that, we are working on having our school nurses be able to provide testing free of charge um, before and after school, depending on your building, um, for students. So 
um, Mr. Shaw can probably talk through, yeah, come on up so people can hear you, um, a little more of the detail. So we actually are working on that and having rapid tests so that you could get the results right away. So Mr. Hearn, first, uh, I'm sorry that was your experience and it's not our desired outcome to be that and we know that the stress that puts on you, your family and your, your children. Um, and every lost day of instruction is a lost opportunity. So with that being said, the decision is not necessarily High Park is doing this, it's actually the New York State guideline that says we must follow this. Um, which really, and it maybe is a good opportunity just to talk through that a little bit, is any individual who's presenting new or worsening symptoms that could be related to COVID-19 must go through this process. And it's what you experience. Have the symptoms, have to stay out, test negative, able to come back. And so what Superintendent Kafka was mentioning is that we are working on a process to alleviate and take that stress and pressure off of families individually. I know personally my, my own uh, health care provider stopped doing walk-in COVID tests. So I can only imagine what I would have to do if I went through it also, that um, we are working for an answer and a solution to that to make it easy that there could be potential. The logistics are still being worked on, but at your building level with your school nurse, a rapid test that could take 15 minutes that could get you that answer. Um, I'm put. I never put my microphone on. I'm sorry. Um, we'll figure out how to get your questions answered. Um, sorry. Why is it working? Should I just talk loud? Yes. Like, I'll just talk loud. Sure. Hi. Okay. Um, this time we're lucky in that the public participation is closed and then at the end of the meeting there's another opportunity. The big presentations are over so it shouldn't be too long to wait. However, our COVID coordinator is not in the meeting and could perhaps yeah. step out and answer some I questions could. with you in the hall in the meantime and then just come back and then you can ask me questions during part two public participation. So just oh, making so can We can't back and forth in the board meeting but um, Mr. Shaw could probably step out and answer your questions now, or it, you know, the, the rest of the agenda moves a little more quickly, and you could wait. And there's another public. We had, um, yeah, last year we sent out consents for surveillance testing, which is different. So surveillance testing is where people without symptoms sign up to get tested and your name will pop up and then you'll have to come in for a test and it was a way of telling what our numbers generally were okay. they were free tests from the state for that purpose they weren't it's the opposite of like having symptoms and getting tested but we want to offer that especially because students are having to stay home when they might just have a cold Um, I just had a quick question. Is there any um, time for like a time frame or a, a clue of when it might be in schools um, at the school level? Um, just because being in the buildings and talking to students, I have friends, I have um, classmates that are missing school and they're not coming to school because they have a headache because in fear that they're going to get sent home for COVID related symptoms. Um, so just knowing that there are kids that need to be in school and just wondering if there's a some kind of time frame that I might be able to give them to reassure them that they won't have to um, be missing school for that period of time, that would be great. I don't know. That is a great think. question and in common with somebody in the room who's wondering a very similar question, like what's the timeline for it to be coming at the school level? Um, I'll leave some of that pieces to the superintendent to discuss, but I, what I will share is that we do have muscle memory. We tested students in school last year. We had a process. At this point, it's just a matter of getting an agreement so that we can move forward with it. So once the agreement is done, I don't think timeline would take very long because we actually, actually have tests in the district. Uh, the tests, and, and a little bit bigger of a, a, a question uh, that came out was um, the tests are uh, actually provided by the county. They're free of charge. And the funding for testing, whether it be testing students or testing staff in the district, is actually right now covered under a grant through Dutchess County and a memorandum of agreement with, I, I hate to be quoted on a number, but a sizable 
amount of funding grant money that was given to the county from the federal government to do testing in schools. So there's a, a, a reservoir of funds available to Dutchess County Schools for that as well. So timeline, once agreements are made, and we have muscle man, memory for process. I'm hoping soon. Um, again, we just need some agreements in place because it does require um, nurses to work after hours or before hours. Okay. Um, so let's move on to board subcommittee reports. Um, did any committees meet? The, the audit committee, committee met. And we just had our we just had our presentation about that. Um, did we meet since the last board meeting? The policy committee met, and we have more policies on the on the agenda. Anybody else? Did anybody else meet? Uh, so the Dutchess County School Board Association okay. met last week, and basically most all districts are having a shortage of bus drivers. So that was common across the county. And one district also had to farm out our bus drivers like we did and they had exactly the same consequences we did so but there are several districts have talked and went to remote for their school board meetings due to very contentious school board meetings and very disrespectful even actually challenging police officers that were in the building so i am just say that we're quite lucky to have such a, a I don't want to say the public has been very respectful in our meetings mm -hmm. and I really appreciate that um, they did plan out for the meetings for the rest of the year so in November will be an in-school health clinic presentation December there will be a school program presentation January will be the area collective bargaining February has not yet been determined March, we'll have NISPA coming in, that's New York State School Board Association, giving us the status of the budget. March 19th, they were having a special meeting for uh, prospective school board members. And there was discussion whether or not they would need to have legislative sessions, but that's still being discussed whether or not they'll do that in the spring. Okay, thank you. Any other committees? Okay, um, the next is board discussion. Um, did anybody have any item for board discussion tonight? I didn't have any topics. Did anybody? Okay. So I just wanted to oh, yeah. give a, a very quick shout out to our tech team. You know, October is Cybersecurity Month nationally. Oh. <laughs> and uh, so the, thank you to the Hyde Park tech team for keeping everybody safe. Some districts have gone through some very tough times, I know personally, and uh, our tech team is on it. So thank you for all that you do. Thank you for bringing that up. Okay, we'll go on to the consent agenda. Um, can I have a motion to um, adopt the, approve the consent agenda for items 10.1 through 10.21? So moved, Jeff. Okay, any discussion? Uh, Denise, I'll be recusing myself from um, discussion and vote on the consent agenda because item 10.11 involves my employer. I had a question on 10 11. Is that something new that we do here, or is that just an ongoing contract? It, it sounds new to me. It is a new thing. Um, it's a pilot year, actually, of something that we're hoping will be successful and will be adopted. To give you a couple of details, we had discussion maybe in December of last year around um, a program called Brothers at Bard, which is uh, really a non-for-profit group that's a reciprocal, um, how do you put it, a reciprocal mentoring program. So where young men of color at a college, so in this case at Bard, receive mentor training 
and they in turn provide mentoring for high school students. Um, in this case, it would be a partnership with the Brothers At program, and they would be working with students at Bard and at uh, FDR. So the contract includes the like scale up of the program, the reach out, the coordination. Um, there's a mentor for students. There's meetings once a month. There's 90 minute mentor sessions that follow that. There's um, something called grind time, which is an opportunity to get like extra help for academics. There's monthly, depending on how things go with all things COVID related, there's the potential for monthly workshops with uh, Ramapo, which is a partner of theirs nearby. Um, let me see if I'm forgetting yeah, I anything. I don't think you have to go, I mean, but it is a sizable yeah. spend, I mean, right? I mean, it is, Agreed. It, yeah. it is a lot of money for that, so maybe at some future meeting we can see a little more about it and you know, work, you know, how the money is used. Is it just you know, profit building on the contract? Is it for other something? Yeah, yeah. That now. no, absolutely. And I, just, I, I would like to see more on, on what this program is. We, we can do that, yeah. And it's being funded out of a grant also, so that's not coming out of the general fund, just in case that mattered to anyone. I had a question about that as well. I was curious if some of the money was going to the actual to the tutors. Are tutors getting paid to do this, or was this the, the college was receiving this, this money? The partnership is with the college. The organization is not. The organization is separate from the college. So the organization Brothers At partners with different colleges. So for instance, if they were mentoring students at another college, it would be Brothers At and then that college name. So it could be like Brothers At Vassar or et cetera. So, so students? it originated at Bard. The mentors in this case would be from Bard. Step one in the agreements to do what you know uh, she just brought up about student uh, testing. Yeah, and this step is. Two is the agreements with the we staff. and we had the the same agreement last year. This is how we get our free tests. Okay. This is how we're allowed to test because we're under the umbrella of the Dutch County um, Department of Behavioral and Community Health, and that's how we're allowed to get the tests and, and administer them. And the same with you know any clinics we run. And all the school districts need to sign the same agreement. Well, so that's good. That's step one, right? Of, of yes, of the process. And we have a lot more steps completed. Okay, good. Any other questions? Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? No, I'm not, I'm not opposed. I'm raising my hand automatically. Abstained. <laughs> we have, and we have one abstention. Right. Okay. okay. Um, motion carries. Okay, 11.1. Um, may I have a motion for special education placements? So moved, Tibbetts. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. May I have a motion for 11.2, first consideration of policies? So moved, Mike. Second, Tibbetts. Any discussion? Yeah, I have a question on uh, policy 1420. It's where we're removing the superintendent of schools, the director to establish a complete procedures for handling complaints. I'm just wondering why we're removing that or is that somewhere else? Greg, you'll have to help me with this one. I do remember having this discussion. I think we talked about the procedure being described in the paragraph above. So we were feeling like this was just redundant. Yeah, I wasn't there, but I'm just looking, and it still yeah. has, if, if the complaints are not satisfied, um, a request can be made for an informal conference with the superintendent or designee. So it's still there in different language in yeah, green. We, so that yeah, was the new it, language. It doesn't say there are committees being formed. So that's why I'm just curious. Why we're not forming committees? Yes. Specifically. 
No, this one, no way. Yeah, but Were we remove it out. Forming committees in the past? I'm probably on. Talk about item three. Hold on. If you push the button all the yes. way to the right, it works. Yeah, yeah. So, Jeff, my recollection is that um, this process here, as outlined and adjusted, is more accurate with like the appeals processes for many of our other policies, and that there wasn't necessarily a committee being created, as the policy would have stated, to review the complaints. So, this actually was an attempt to bring into alignment the policy with like existing practices that we have. Okay. I just wanted to make sure we were looking at it. I don't want to make it look like we're trying to shut down anything that someone may have a complaint about our curriculum. That's all. Is, no. the, is the formation of a committee still an option? Because the, uh, the uh, complainant can go to the superintendent. And the, one, of the, one of the options of the superintendent is to create a committee. Is that correct? It, the policy doesn't speak directly to what the superintendent would or wouldn't do in terms of that. So um, I guess I would suppose that that, that would be um, an option to the superintendents um, or their designee, as stated on the, on the third paragraph there. Yep. Yeah. Any other questions? Sorry, I wasn't on. May I have a motion for 11.3, acknowledge receipt and acceptance of external audit. Um, any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Okay, may I have a motion to go into second public participation? So moved, Jeff. Second Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, um, as a general rule, public participation will be limited to three minutes total per speaker, with the second public participation segment limited to 12 minutes. The segment of time may be modified by the board as deemed appropriate and the board requests that remarks be courteous and respectful for all. Is there anybody who would like to address the board? Okay, at this time we'll close public participation. 13.1, other matters deemed necessary by the board? Okay, there are, there are none. There's no need to go into a second executive session. Um, may I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? So moved, Jack. Second, Tibbetts. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Meeting's adjourned. Thank you.